Good morning, everyone. I'm Mariah Musi with the New York Fed's communications team. Thank you for joining our webinar on COVID-19's impact on the labor market across income, age, and race. Formerly known as the Heterogeneity Series, our newly named Economic Inequality Liberty Street Economics blog series highlights differences in economic outcomes and policy impacts by race, gender, income, education, and other factors. Today, we will be discussing the three blogs in this sixth series specifically focused on labor market outcomes. The speakers will provide an overview of the three blogs in this series, followed by Q&A. I ask that you please hold your questions until then, and please be sure to mute your microphone during the presentation and during the Q&A when you are not speaking. As mentioned in my email this morning, this webinar is on the record and attributable to the respective speakers. Before we begin, I quickly want to introduce my colleagues at the New York Fed, whom you will hear from on today's call. Giving introductory remarks is Andrew Howitt, Senior Vice President. Our presenters today are Raji Chakrabarty, Senior Economist, Jason Abel, Assistant Vice President, and Fati Karahan, Senior Economist. Also on the call today are the co-authors of the blog series, Maxim Pinkowski, Senior Economist, Richard Dietz, Assistant Vice President, and Laura Pilosov, Economist. Before we begin, let me give our standard disclaimer that all comments reflect the opinions of the authors and do not necessarily reflect the views of the New York Fed or the Federal Reserve System. With that, I'll turn the webinar over to Andrew for introductory remarks. Thanks, Mariah. And good morning, everyone, and welcome to the New York Fed. Today, our economists are going to discuss the dramatic and dramatically uneven effects that COVID-19 has had on the labor market. As you may recall, it was less than a year ago that we presented really excellent news from the labor market. Unemployment was low overall and for many specific groups, including historic lows for black workers. And wage growth was strong across the board. But the good news was already almost over. The US lost over 22 million jobs in the first two months of the pandemic, with some of the largest effects on the same groups that have been making significant gains in the prior expansion. As we'll see, the nature of work also changed substantially and in different ways for workers of different income levels, races, and gender. Now, we often see that the negative impacts of economic recessions disproportionately fall on the most vulnerable groups. But the differences this time around have been even more pronounced than usual. As the labor market has recovered, some of these disparities have begun to narrow, but we still have a long way to go. This morning's posts bring to us to 25 economic inequality posts since October 2019. We do this work and will continue to do it as part of the New York Fed's commitment to improving economic outcomes for all segments of society. So with that, let me ask Jason Abel to give a brief overview of the first post. Great, right, thanks, Andy. And good morning, everyone. Uh, this post is joint with Rich Dietz. So the title of our post is some workers have been hit much harder than others by the pandemic. And really the goal of the post is to document the employment dynamics through the pandemic, not only during the initial downturn, which is ground that's been pretty well covered by others, but also through the recovery and during this renewed period of weakness at the end of 2020, where there's been much less attention paid to what's been happening in the labor market. So next slide, please, Raji. So uh, what are the key takeaways? What do we find in our post? So first, it's very clear that job losses during the pandemic have been highly uneven. And in particular, what we show is that lower wage workers and those without a college degree have been hit the hardest. And that's been throughout the entire time period. Women, minorities, and younger workers also experienced outsized losses early on. So, you know, what's going on here? Why is this the case? Well, much of the differences can be traced to the different kinds of jobs held by these workers. And in particular, we use new data that's been collected during the pandemic to show very clearly that higher wage workers are much more likely 
to be able to work from home than lower wage workers. This is a point that Raji and Maxim, who are also on the panel, explore in much greater depth in their post. So what's happened during the recovery? And this is pretty new information. It turns out that many of the initial differences that opened early on have actually narrowed considerably as jobs returned. And that's especially true across demographic groups. So just as one example, the gap between men and women that opened in the initial uh, part of the downturn has closed entirely by uh, the end of 2020. And so Fatih and Laura, who again are also on the panel today, are going to explore this a bit more in a bit more detail for black and white workers in their post. Now, what's been happening during this recent weakening? Also new information here. So it turns out as the job market began to weaken toward the end of last year, and this is due to the renewed surge in the virus, some of the gaps have started to widen again, as many of the most vulnerable workers are once again being hit the hardest. And in fact, if you look at the first chart in our post, it shows pretty clearly that uh, during this recent weakening, the job losses have really been concentrated among workers at the bottom of the uh, wage distribution. So those are the key points in, in our post, and I'll, I'll turn it over now to uh, Raji, who will cover the second post in the series. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Um, this is joint work with Ruchi Avtar and Maxim Pinkowski. And the title is Understanding the Racial and Income Gap in Commuting for Work Following COVID-19. Um, this post will try to understand whether the commuting for work behavior following COVID-19 differed across race and income. COVID-19 led to numerous changes. One of the more important changes has been where we work from. The state and business closures, as well as uh, many voluntary pullbacks, saw a large decline in both full-time and part-time workers commuting to work as a large fraction of the labor force transitioned to working from home. But as our post shows, these commuting for work patterns were drastically different across income and across race. Here in this post, we actually exploit unique data, mobile phone data from SafeGraph to kind of unearth these patterns, and more details are, are there in the post. So what we find here is that low income and majority minority communities so a considerably smaller decline in workers commuting to work. And we should say that we define low-income communities as those that fall in the bottom 25% of the median household distribution, income distribution. And we define majority minority communities as those in which at least half of the population is Hispanic and non-Hispanic Black. What we also find is that when the states reopened and the economy started coming back, it was associated with almost an equally large return to commuting to work. But this return was considerably different between low income, other income, minority communities, and other communities. What did we see? We found that it was considerably larger and faster in low-income and minority communities. Why do we see these differences in patterns across race and across income? This is likely because low-income and minority communities are more dependent on occupations that require commuting to work. Think, for example, of grocery store workers, cashiers. These jobs are less amenable to working from home. In contrast, workers in communities that are relatively higher income or not majority minority are relatively more likely to be able to work from home. Think here of managers, attorneys, economists, or workers in IT or finance. So with that, I'm going to pass it on to Fati to talk about the next post. Fati? Thanks, Raji. Um, so this is um, actually joint work with David Dam, Megan Agaur, Laura Pilosov, who's also with us here, and, and Will Shermer. Um, we were interested in, in the black-white differences in labor market outcomes during uh, the COVID recession. As Andy has mentioned, and the work of my colleagues, as well as other existing research has shown, 
Um, the negative impacts of a downturn tend to fall disproportionately on certain groups of the population. For example, you know, for our case, in terms of the black-white differences, during the Great Recession, the unemployment rate among the black population rose much more than that among the white, which pushed the unemployment rate gap, the, the difference between the two, uh, of the unemployment rate between the two groups, uh, to more than eight percentage points. And this gap was very slow to close. Um, and only despite, you know, thanks to the robust expansion by early 2021, before the, the recession hit, um, the difference was below three percentage points. Now, with, with COVID, when the unemployment rate was fat, rising, rising really fast in the aggregate, it did more uh, among the black population, and the unemployment gap um, was, uh, it reached again about five percentage points. So this is lower than the peak unemployment rate gap um, during the Great Recession, but it's not because the unemployment rate increased by less um, for the black population, but it was because the unemployment rate actually increased more for among the white population. Nevertheless, the recovery has been uneven with the unemployment rate falling faster um, for white workers, which is why the, the gap has, been, uh, has remained large. Um, and given that this gap historically tends to be slow to close, uh, the increase is, is concerning. Um, and so in this post, we wanted to understand a little better the dynamics behind the different experiences between the black and white workers. And so um, we basically investigated the rates at which people transition between employment, unemployment, and non-participation, and how these rates differ by race. In the end, it is these flows that determine the evolution of uh, unemployment rate and labor force participation and so on. What we found is that a lower job finding rate among the black population is uh, largely responsible for the slower decline of the unemployment rate. That is, the, the job availability was lower for black unemployed workers, which was putting uh, upper pressure on their unemployment rate relative to the, to the white unemployed workers. Um, but black workers now recently actually are slightly more likely to find a job. So all else the same, this should imply a faster decline, uh, faster recovery for them going forward. Interestingly to, to us, I mean, we were surprised by this finding that the differences in job loss rates do not really explain the rising unemployment gap. Historically, this is because historically black workers have lost their jobs at a greater rate than, uh, than, than white workers. Lastly, we looked at labor force exit. Um, this is an important margin for labor market dynamics because when people remain unemployed for long, they tend to get discouraged and drop out of labor force. And then they're also slow to return even if the economy recovers, which means the employment to population ratio may remain depressed for longer, especially if this is more prevalent for, for black workers, more, more worrying for, for, for that group. Our findings here are indeed a bit worrisome in that this kind of exit, uh, you know, for, among unemployed uh, workers to, to non-participation to rose uh, more among the black population, and this may actually lead to an uneven labor market recovery. With that, uh, I'm going to pass it back to Mariah. Thank you, Fati. With that, we're now ready to take questions. To ask a question, you will raise your virtual hand function, and when I call your name, you will unmute yourself to ask your question. Please state your name and affiliation before asking the question, and remember to keep yourself on mute if you are not asking a question, and to lower your virtual hand when you have finished your question. Chris from Associated Press, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Sure. Hi. Thank you. Um, thanks for doing this. It's Chris Rugeber. I'm at the AP. Uh, I guess my first question is for Jason and I guess Rich on their uh, blog post. Um, I was wondering uh, what kind of historical, how this, how your findings, if you had any chance to look at historically how this relates to previous recessions, particularly perhaps the Great uh, Recession in terms of uh, the focus of job loss in lower income workers. Um, and uh, what does this say about, you know, has job loss been, in, in previous recessions, sometimes job loss has spread to more industries and it would appear this is not happening in this case. Um, is that a fair reading of your, uh, of your findings? 
and how does that compare previously? Maybe I'll give this a shot as a, as a starting point. This is Jason Abel. So th I think there's some similarities and differences between this, this current downturn and the Great Recession. Um, obviously, this, this particular episode is very different from a typical business cycle standard recession. I mean, this was really an exogenous force that sort of came in and provided a negative shock to the economy. And um, the, the, the speed and the depth and the magnitude of this downturn is much, much deeper than really anything on record, including the Great Recession. And at least initially, it was much more concentrated into certain sectors of the economy, especially things like leisure and hospitality, retail, where, where there's a lot, you know, anything involving services that require face-to-face -face interaction that obviously in a pandemic are very hard to, to perform. And a major shift toward things like goods and services, I'm sorry, like toward goods, which in a normal cyclical downturn, it's the manufacturing sector that, that, that tends to be hit, you know, hit hard. So, a very different kind of thing. So what are some of the, the similarities and differences? So, um, you know, I think as Andy noted, it, it, it's pretty much the case in most downturns, certain kinds of vulnerable workers, you know, minorities, um, typically it's men uh, in, in recessions are, are hit harder. Um, so here we saw that, you know, minorities, younger workers were definitely hit harder. We show that in our, in our post. Um, but what's been very different about this particular uh, downturn is that uh, women have actually, you know, early on at least, women were hit harder than um, than men. Again, normally that had a lot to do with just the nature of the shock and the composition. And, and, and for women in particular, this time around with um, children being in, in the home and, and away from school in particular, often it's the case that women bear more of the uh, the burden and the responsibility with, with, uh, with child care. So that was a, a major um, impediment early on in the recession. Now, it does, it has turned out that over the course of, of the recovery, that gap has closed. And I think part of the reason that it's, it's closed is that schools have opened up again. Children have, some children have been able to go back into school. There's been some adjustments um, made in terms of child care. Women are actually uh, able, able to work at a slightly higher rate from home than men. And so all of those things have helped close those gaps. Um, but in terms of the big picture, some similarities, some differences, um, but this is a pretty unique uh, situation. Can I just, can just a quick follow up on women? Um, does your data take into account, say, a woman who quit uh, work as opposed to a layoff and dropped out of the workforce? Did that that be captured? I didn't. I skimmed your thing. Didn't. I wasn't sure if that was captured in there. That kind of dynamic. Thank you. So we we don't have the ability to, to differentiate between uh, women who who quit versus who are just laid off. That's not something that the uh, at least that we studied in our post. We were really we're looking at the actual just dynamics, how, how the flow of workers uh, in, into jobs and out of jobs looked. Um, so both of those factors are likely contributing, especially early on in the, in the patterns. Thank Please. you. Just to add one thing maybe, um, yeah, qu quickly. I mean, I, I completely agree with you in that the, the nature of the recession is, is very different uh, in the sense that this is a lot more sectoral, whereas the Great Recession may be starting to certain sectors, but then propagated. So we were also actually expecting to find different dynamics in, in you know, in the dynamics of unemployment um, in the aggregate and by race as well. Um, but that didn't turn out to be the case, and it's, it's definitely worth exploring more in the sense that, uh, you know, if you look at the Great Recession, it's also at the onset of the recession, it's mostly the job loss component that accounts for the dynamics of unemployment also by race. Kind of why certain groups are more cyclically sensitive is because they have high, larger job loss rates that's also more, more sensitive to the economy. But this time, actually, it's – and, and in, the, in, the, in the recovery, it's, it's the job finding rate, you know, how fast the availability of jobs return – uh, back to normal, that determines, um, you know, how fast the unemployment rate goes back to normal. Um, and, you know, despite the fact that the, the, the nature of the two recessions are very different, we do find that it's still um, kind of both in the aggregate and by race, it's the dynamics of job loss at the onset of the recession and then kind of the slow um, coming back, returning of, of jobs for different groups um, that, that explain the differences in labor market outcomes. Thank you, Fati. Next, we'll go on to Nancy marshall Genzer. Nancy, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Sure. Thank you for the question. 
Um, just wondering if you can span, expand a little bit more on the narrowing of the gaps between the demographic groups and women and men uh, being at parity and whether that happened uh, more quickly than in prior recessions and um, what else you attribute that to? So I'll, I'll start uh, with this. I mean, I think one thing it, I can just reiterate what Jason Abel was saying, uh, which is that, again, there, there are some differences this cycle around in terms of women uh, tending to be affected more than men in terms of having a steeper job loss. But as far as why these gaps have closed, you know, I think, again, the gap is closed between men and women in part because women have been able to get back into the labor force more quickly, especially as uh, children return to work. But also, you know, over the past couple of months, for men, we've seen employment start to decline again. Um, and that hasn't happened for women. So this is also part of the reason that the gap is closed between uh, the genders. Um, as far as looking at why the gap is closed, you know, it closed somewhat when we look at differences by wage groups uh, and even by education. So, for example, we know that uh, there is a very wide gap between low-wage workers and high-wage workers that closed quite a bit. Uh, by late in the cycle. But again, that, that gap hasn't actually closed. It's begun to open up again. It closed up through September, October, uh, but in November and December, uh, job losses resumed for low-wage workers, uh, while actually jobs increased amongst high-wage workers. Uh, so we're seeing that gap open up again. Uh, as far as uh, the gaps by race, that's a little bit harder to explain, I think. Um, again, we know uh, that uh, uh, minority workers were hit harder early on, and then those gaps began to close. But again, it's as these jobs came back, the people that lose their jobs in certain sectors that got hit hardest, when those sectors recover, they begin to get their jobs back. So uh, the gaps would sort of almost naturally begin to close again. Uh, but there still is a gap between white workers and black and Hispanic workers. Uh, the other thing that we looked at is by age group. It's kind of a similar story there, where young workers were hit the hardest. Uh, as jobs returned, especially in leisure and, leisure and hospitality, where a lot, of, a lot of young workers are, uh, the gap began to close. Um, but again, beginning in September and October, when the uh, labor market began to weaken somewhat again, the gaps didn't really close so much between older workers and younger workers, but they didn't really, um, uh, they kind of stayed much narrower than where they were earlier on in the business cycle. And sorry, did you have any reason for the gap between the black and white workers not closing like maybe you would have expected it to? Well, I'm not sure we had um, much expectation here. And I think, um, again, uh, uh, Fati, Fati's post, uh, Fati and Laura's post kind of looks at uh, this by race a little bit more detail and looks at it in terms of the job finding rates. Um, and I think that mechanically at least can explain some of what's going on here. Do any of the want to chime in before we move on? Um, so yeah, Laura actually has has more work on on kind of what kind of jobs are affected. I think in the end, what our post really says is what really is going to determine how fast the gap is going to close is how fast these jobs return, and that to me, you know, is is primarily a function of how how fast how fast or how efficient are we at fighting with the virus. Um, the, the sooner the better, because then we can, pre you know, we can prevent uh, scarring, permanent scarring of these uh, of these workers. But Laura actually had done more work on kind of which groups uh, are affected more. Um, you know, they were more likely to work in uh, high contact jobs. Maybe she can add some something. Yes. Hi. So um, I, ha I have some previous work that's joint with Simon Mangi and Alex Weinberg, where we um, we looked at trying to classify occupations by their um, ability to be done from home, as well as the degree of physical proximity that they require to others at work. Um, and both of those were meant to be measures of kind of uh, an occupation's exposure to the pandemic more, more broadly. And what we did find, um, maybe not surprisingly, was that um, workers that are more likely to be employed in those types of occupations had, you know, suffered larger employment losses at the beginning of the pandemic. We also, you know, in, in follow-up work, we found that that actually um, that the, the employment losses did somewhat recover. If you look at a longer uh, time period from the, you know, onset of the pandemic, let's say to August rather than, than April. Um, but, it, it, but it is, uh, my, my, my uh, suspicion is that it, it does have a lot to do with 
the, the types of occupations that these different workers are employed in because we did find that um, black workers are more likely to, to be employed in occupations that require high physical proximity. And as Fati mentioned, um, if the virus is still raging on, those types of jobs are not going to be able to come back. Thank you, Laura. Next, we'll go on to Janelle Mark, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Hi, Janelle Marte with Reuters. Thank you for doing this. My question is about the metrics that you're using when you say that the gap closed between men and women, because the labor force participation rate, for instance, dropped more for women than for men as in the latest jobs report. I also have a question about the um, widening that you're re referencing again, widening of the gaps. And I just want to make sure I, I explain those gaps um, appropriately and make sure it's for the right groups. I think it's mostly black and white and maybe low wage and high wage, but I wanted to see if you could just clarify. Um, why don't I start on this one? Um, so just to be clear, the gaps, the, the only gap that's closed completely is the gap between men and women. And the metric we're using is just, we're looking at the number of employed men and the number of employed women looking at the percentage changes. So in other words, Employment right now is about 5% below where it was pre-pandemic for both men and women, and it's not really any different anymore. So that's that's the gap that's closed. When we say we look at um, probably chart one on our blog post, which looks at trends over time by wage group, that's probably the best way to get at least, a, you know, looking at how the gaps have begun, how the gaps started to close, and then wide again amongst these different wage groups. So when you look at that chart, the high wage group, uh, has seen is employment is kind of a flat line throughout the entire cycle uh, that we've been through. Whereas for low wage workers, we saw a decline of close to 40%, and then it, you know the decline the decline um, the, the gap narrowed as jobs came back. But again, beginning beginning in, in November December, uh, the number of low wage workers has begun to decline again, whereas the number of high wage workers has actually increased. So that's what we mean by the gap widening. Um, it's still there. It never closed. Um, and it's a similar story when you look at those with a college degree versus those without a college degree. Uh, the gaps came pretty close to closing, but over, just over the past month or two, so it's a little bit soon to say what kind of a trend this is, uh, those without a college degree uh, saw employment begin to trend downward again, where those with a college degree saw employment begin to trend upward. So that's what we mean by that gap widening again. By a race, it's kind of like the, the, the gaps open up again early on in the pandemic as, as Black and Hispanic workers saw bigger declines, but they also started to see some more significant gains as jobs began to return. But the, so the gaps got pretty narrow by October, November. And then all that we're seeing now is that while white workers, employment has held fairly steady, there's been a little bit of a decline amongst Hispanic workers and Black workers. So it's a very small gap at this point. So I, I wanted to add a little bit relating to Laura's comment to the last question. So uh, Maxim and uh, Ruchi and I, the post that we have looked at, it basically a large part of the dynamic is about the type of work. And uh, it is true that we find that in low income communities as well as majority minority communities, it is more likely to be the case that they are doing in-person jobs, and because of that, they have to commute to work. So the type of work is quite different, and that does explain uh, some of the dynamic, whereas in other communities, like relatively higher income or uh, communities that are not minor, majority minority, there, there, there is a larger incidence of work that is more amenable to working from home. And that that also is part of the difference or change in dynamic that happened post COVID, and uh, that to some extent also increases people's susceptibility to COVID nineteen if there is you know increased uh, exposure and moving on basically commuting for work. I don't know if Maxim wanted to add anything to this. Uh, well, just wanted to highlight that. Uh, jobs that can be performed from home, uh, both were uh, at less of a risk of being lost, uh, and presumably it was easier to restore them. Uh, and at the same time, these jobs exposed the job holder uh, 
to less of a health risk. Uh, they did not need to take public transportation. They did not need to interact with other individuals at work. Uh, so uh, these uh, jobs had uh, a kind of uh, double uh, advantage to their job holders. Yeah, just, just to expand on that just a bit, because there's a lot of questions that have been touching on why certain groups have been hit harder than others. I think it's important to point out that minority workers have tended to be hit harder by the pandemic in general. So they have you know, higher rates of being affected by the pandemic directly and being sick. So that's one of the reasons why the uh, minority groups might have been affected a little bit more. Thank you. And related to Jason's point, actually, we had a previous series where we basically looked at Maxim uh, was one of the co-authors, Ruchi Aftar was another co-author, is not here right now. We basically tried to understand the gap in income gap and the race gap of COVID-19, and we looked at various factors. One of those factors were uh, basically, whether or not being essential workers relate to some of these differences. But in general, we looked at many of the factors and definitely uh, highlighted the differences by race and income in COVID-19 intensity. Thank you, Raji. Does anyone else have anything to add before we move on to the next question? Beth Fertig, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Thank you. So you're looking at people whose jobs are countable. <laughs> what can you tell us about these gaps? Is there a way that you can account the people who are gig workers who work for apps and aren't considered full-time employees? Have any of you looked at how to add that to the mix and how can we quantify that? I'll start on this one. So I, this is an interesting question. It's a good point. Um, you're right. These official data sources that uh, we, we, we economists tend to rely on for, for these kinds of analyses aren't perfect. They don't capture the gig workers in particular. Um, so it, it's a good point. We don't have a great answer for it right now. Um, just to clarify, the, the, you know, the information we do have is capturing part-time and full-time workers. So there's no, there's no missing information there. It's, it's really just some of these uh, these types of jobs, um, you know, like, like you mentioned, the gig, the gig areas where we, we don't have good coverage right now. I don't know if the, if the other labor economists have any other views they'd like to offer. I wanted to add that the data that Maxim and I, we are using in our post actually relies on mobile phone data. So that would actually capture gig workers. In fact, it would capture anybody who is moving away from their home location to another location to either work full-time or part-time. So that's definitely the charts that you see there or the, you know, the declines in uh, commuting for work and then the slowly coming back to commuting to work and the differences there by race and income. Those patterns definitely include big workers as well as long as they are commuting to work. In particular, these charts would, for example, include uh, someone who is an Uber driver, uh, but not someone who uh, does tasks on Mechanical Turk. From home. Do any of the other blog authors have anything else to add before we go to the next question? Okay. I, mean, the, I just want to resonate kind of the same thing. It's a little bit hard in the traditional data sources that we use to focus on this kind of work. Uh, unfortunately, we, we couldn't really look at that. Thank you, Bati. Ben Castleman, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Thanks all. Uh, ben Castleman with the New York Times. Um, just to come back to the, the gender question that I think several people have already asked about, um, it, it seems sort of reasonably intuitive that the gender gap would have closed some over the course of this recovery. But I, I think what seems surprising, to me at least, is for it to have closed entirely, at least on an employment rate uh, metric. And just curious, I mean, given that sort of many of the factors that led to those gender gaps appearing in the first place seem to be at least partly still in place, and given the reversal that we saw in some of the other metrics, 
in during the slowdown over the last couple of months so I guess we didn't see in gender just sort of curious if you have theories as to why that gap has closed entirely and also whether it might look different if we disaggregate by presence of children or, or marital status or related sort of family structures. This is Jason Abel. I'll take a stab at the first one. And I, I think really maybe just to reiterate, reiterate some of the points already made, but more, more focused on your exact question. I think um, one, one of the key reasons why early on in the pandemic, um, and, and, and this is so different from this particular downturn than others, that, that women were hit harder than men is, is because it is the case that with this pandemic, kids went back into the home at a much higher rate, you know, leaving schools. There, there was that period of time early on, especially when lockdowns were in effect, um, staying home orders were in place. And so um, the, the, the child raising responsibilities just disproportionately fell more on women. Um, so one hypothesis, you know, I don't think we have, you know, data that allows us to literally observe this, but one hypo one thing we know is that women actually are able to work from home a bit at a bit higher rate than men. And I think that it's possible what's happened is that over the course of the uh, recovery period, some adjustments have been made. First and foremost, you know, some some number of children have been, you know, back into school. We actually see that the gap closed, the, where the steepest uh, trajectory in the, in the closing of the gap happened was right around September when, when a lot of kids did go back into school. So that, it seems that that's clearly, you know, part of the, part of the story. And then the ability to work from home, I think that just means that potentially, you know, some adjustments were made to be able to have a little more flexibility in the, in the, in the, in the you know, work environment to allow for not only working and having the job, but also to be able to have, you know, these family responsibilities as well. But the other thing, and I, you know, I think Rich Geets mentioned this, part of what has happened in terms of the gap fully closing is that during this last couple of months, as the economy has weakened again because of the new surge of the virus, it's not so much that women have gained on men. Actually, it's that men have, have, have lost jobs and have kind of fell back down to where the women are. So it's a combination of all those things that leaves you to the point where at the end of 2020, the, the, the shortfall gap. So comparing back to where jobs were pre-pandemic, February of 2020, that, 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 that the job shortfall is now um, uh, even across, across gender. Yeah, that's just one thing I want to clarify here, because when we talk about these gaps, we're, we're referring to something very, very specific. We're not talking about these kind of structural gaps between men and women in terms of labor force participation and saying those have changed or employment trends or unemployment rates between men and women. All that we're saying is we're looking at employment levels before the pandemic compared to now or the most recent month we have data, which is December. And we're looking at how the cycle affected, the, you know, how the cycle opened up a gap and then closed it again. So um, I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Conscious of time, do we have any other questions? I know Chris, you have your right hand, but any other outlets that would like to ask a question before we get on to concluding? All right, Chris, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Well, thanks. Well, sorry, I just, uh, again, on the men and women issue, <laughs> I mean, uh, I just, it's still a little surprising, you know, the last jobs report, sh I mean, the last two jobs reports have sh showed men gaining jobs, or at least men 20 and over, um, and you were mentioning that they've lost. Now, I, maybe this is a seasonal adjustment issue. Uh, men have lost, I guess, on non-seasonal adjusted basis. And the other, it it sounded like that for, on the labor force participation, not, not only, I, I understand you're not looking at structural differences, but it sounds like if a woman has lost a job and has stopped looking compared to a man who's lost a job and can continue to look, since you're not looking at LFPR, you're looking at EPOP, that that would not be something you would pick up, if I understand right, and just wanted to clarify those two things. Thank you. Well, just in terms of that participation, it, it kind of is going to get picked up indirectly because all we're looking at are just a number of women employed and a number of men employed. Uh, so it's nothing, nothing fancy about that at all. Um, what was the, the first part of your question again? Just a straight, sorry, yeah, you know, just a straight reading of the jobs report shows oh, that right, right. have yeah, gained so jobs I, in the past two months. Yeah. yeah, so there's a couple of things. I mean, first of all, our data are only going up through December, um, and we are looking at not seasonally adjusted data, so we're just tracking the paths. So there may be some differences between the official figures, which sometimes are due with different restrictions based on age. 
Um, but uh, and, and we don't have January data to do the kind of analysis that we did yet. It looks like that Thank is all of our questions. Is there anything the blog authors would like to add before we conclude? Oh, Nancy, I know you have a question if you want to ask it rather quickly. Yeah, just super quick. Um, it just <clears throat> to clarify, you know, you're saying all you're looking at is the number of women and men employed. So when the gap closed at the end of 2020, you, you're just saying that you had an equal number of men and women employed? Relative to pre-pandemic levels, uh, an, equal, an equal loss. So like one of our one of our charts shows the current shortfall with the, the by demographic group. So it's 5%. Both men and women are 5% below where they were before the pandemic. Whereas if you looked a few months ago, um, the job loss would be not as severe for men versus women. Okay, so equal equal job loss. At yes, the end that's one way to put it. Yep. Thank you, Rich. Is there anything else the blog authors want to add before we conclude? All right, with that, we'll conclude today's call. Thank you everyone for attending and please feel free to reach out directly to me, Mariah Meezy. If you have any follow-up questions, please remember that this webinar is on the record and attributable to the respective speakers. Thank you very much for participating and have a good rest of your day.